Great. Um, so uh, across to our second uh, uh, presentation for the uh, um, for the case studies. So really pleased to introduce Pierre. Pierre is um, a PhD student uh, working with uh, myself, um, and he's doing well lots of interesting things around time and computation. Um, but today he's going to talk to you uh, about some of the work I think I've mentioned a little bit in some of the lectures around multi-fidelity experimental design for IC models. So would you, yeah. Hello. Hi. All right. Yeah, so this is a lot of work we've done in conjunction with the British Antarctic Survey, who's been kind of helping me understand what are ice models and stuff, because they're quite complicated. So I'm going to first, okay, yeah. So first, I'm going to give you a small introduction on ice sheet models, because most of you probably don't know much about them, but they're quite interesting to model. Um, and I also thought it would be nice to talk about something that's not machine learning for the beginning. Am I missing something? No, no, it's all right. It's all right. Um, yeah, so I'll talk a bit about IQ models, I'll tell you what they are, what they do, how they work. Um, then I'll move on to the more machine learning aspect, which is this multi fidelity experimental design, which is basically a combination of things you should have probably talked about in your lecture uh, from what I understood. Um, then I'll chat a bit about some theoretical insights that you can get into how those algorithms are working, whether they're doing well or not. Um, I'll move on to a small notebook where I show how this can be applied to like simple differential equations, PDEs, and things like that. And then I'll mention some interesting directions, projects you might want to do or things like that. Right, so I'm going to start with what are ice sheet models. I'm quite a visual person, so I like to put like pictures and videos. Um, so this is going to be not working. Obviously, no, here you go. Um, so this is basically the Antarctica. The transparent bit is going to be uh, sea ice, which is just ice floating on the water. And this area is called the uh, Amundsen Sea. And it's basically the area we're modeling. And the goal of ice sheet models is basically going to be to try to find the, something. I'm just going to go on the left side. Um, right, I'm just going to back it up. Okay, so the goal is to find spatial uh, vectors that tells us how each of the points in the Antarctic are moving through time. And then we can use basically this information to deduce things like melting of ice and things like that. The other thing that's interesting to model is not just how the ice sheet moves through time, but it's also um, its elevation change, the shape of the ice sheet. So sometimes it's going to compress, sometimes it's going to like relax. And so it's kind of like trying to model all those various aspects. So that's what um, in particular, the British Antarctic is spending a lot of time doing. Um, why are they useful? Um, there's lots of reasons why they can be useful, but in the context of BAS, um, they're really focusing on predicting the contribution to sea level. So basically, those ice sheets, ice sheets are going to like come over the ocean and they're going to start melting. Um, and using those dynamics model, you can kind of predict how much ice is going to melt through time, basically. Um, and the reason why it's important to do those modeling is because ice sheets are not just like stationary ice cubes on Earth. Basically, they're going to move, they're going to deform, they're going to melt, and this, so there's lots of forces that are interesting to consider. Um, there's two interesting facts that I thought was kind of fun to mention. The first one is if all the ice, just to give a context of how big the Antarctic is, if all the ice were to melt, that would lead to 60 meters increase in sea level. Um, so that would probably be most a lot of the UK and a lot of places in the world. Um, the other one that I like to talk about also is um, if you climb the Eiffel Tower and you do that 15 times, that's going to be the deepest point of ice in the Antarctic. So it's 15 Eiffel Tower tall, which I don't know. It's kind of nice to give a bit of context as to um, how big the ice sheet is, basically. And so the goal, as I mentioned earlier, is going to be trying to predict how things are going to move in 10, 15, 50 years, basically. Um, okay, I'll talk a bit about how are the ice sheet model um, working. So there's two goals. The first one is we want to predict the velocities at each spatial location forward in the future. The secondary goal is we want to predict the shape of the ice sheet. So it's 3D tru structure and geometry. Um, and there's two components that they consider. The first one is the mass balance. Uh, so the mass balance are going to be things that are going to be changing, like ice is going to melt. Um, sometimes you're going to have snowfall. And so that's going to create like differentials in mass. Um, and the second one is going to be physical forces such as gravity, friction. Um, so gravity is just the ice is going to go towards the bottom of the cliff or something like that. Um, or the other one that's really important is the friction with the bedrock. So there's 
under this 15 km, 10 kilometers of ice, there's a bedrock. And we don't know what it looks like. It could be slanted, it could be, there could be mountains. Um, and so there's a quite a tricky inverse problem here where you're trying to model the physical force um, that are dependent on this bedrock, but you don't know what the bedrock is. So you try to infer what this bedrock looks like. Uh, I'll mention a bit more on this after. Um, and the physical model that they use basically is kind of like, it's coming from physics. And it's basically just like a viscous fluid uh, moving through time and you have external forces that are applied to it. Um, one thing that's interesting to mention also is like, this is not particularly super important to understand really well for the rest of the talk, but I just think it's interesting to give some context as to what it does basically. Um, so the mass balance that I mentioned, basically, um, you can see on the picture of the right, kind of like a toy illustration. Um, at the bottom of the ice sheet, you can have some melting. So that's going to be a negative mass. Uh, on the top of the ice sheet, you can have positive mass increases with like snowfall and things like that. Um, and so that's kind of like ice sheet 101 thing that people consider to model. Um, and then the other one is the physical forces. Um, so if you take a simplified model, um, the simplest model you can think about is you take into account two forces. The first one is gravity, so ice falls down. The second one is basal drag. Basal drag is what I was talking about earlier, where you have friction with the ground. And so it's going to like apply a force that's in a different direction than the gravitational um, stress. And then the model in particular that we're considering includes, I think, nine different forces, um, which have things like um, the ice is going to compress, and so it's going to be like a vertical stress gradient. There's lots of like different forces and lots of different parts. I think what's most interesting to think about uh, with all those different forces is that it's a very, very complex system to simulate. Um, and that's going to lead on to the next part of the talk. Yeah. Another impulse that you make by ice kind of go up here. I mean, the full model that isn't any snowfall or something. Is it a case where, for example, ice down below kind of expands or retreats and then it makes things go up here? Um, like the only thing that makes ice go back up is uh, snowfall and stuff. Yeah, I think so. That would be my first guess, but maybe there's a counterexample. Um, I think that basically the bedrock is going to be telling you that it should, but okay, let's think about the bedrock. Um, yeah, no, I don't think I would go up. <laughs> I don't know. I'll think about it. It's a good question. Um, okay, so this is just a summary of all the various forces and a nice illustrated uh, image. So basically we have snow accumulation at the top that is gonna have a tendency to go downwards. You're gonna have ablation, like melting of ice that's gonna be happening at the bottom. And then you're gonna have the uh, external forces, especially with respect to the bedrock, um, that are gonna be forcing the ice in various ways. And it's important we don't know this bedrock. Um, so that's gonna be a lot of the focus is just the inverse problem of inferring the bedrock basically. Um, yeah. One last little thing. Um, that I think is interesting is once you have the model of the movement of the ice, how do you get from that to uh, the melting of the ice sheet? Um, so if you don't know anything about ice sheets, uh, you'd be thinking, well, you know, it just melts because, I don't know, there's sun or maybe it starts touching a bit of water. But the big part of the melting is actually happening um, through this process of those water coming from the circumpolar deep water that comes in that kind of like erodes the ice sheet from the bottom um, and kind of like um, melts the ice. And so basically, most, and so if the ice sheet keeps moving forward, you're gonna have more and more melting and it's gonna erode more and more when this, within this ice sheet. Um, and so basically what we're gonna do is we're gonna run our model, our ice sheet model forward in time. We're gonna look uh, which patch of ice end up over the water. And then we're going to have like an average melt rate that is parameterized, and we're going to induce the melting, the contribution to sea level for that. Okay, now I'm taking a bit of a step back, and I'm going to slowly transition into the more machine learning aspect. Um, so the goal that we are going to work on is basically we run this ice sheet for 100 years in the future, and we're going to try to predict what is the contribution to the sea level uh, from the melting. Um, and one of the tricky bits, basically, as I mentioned before, is that we have lots of parameters to this model and there's lots of uncertainty. So we don't know the bedrock, we don't know the precipitation rate, we don't know the melting rate. So there's lots of like different variables we don't know. Um, so the way that they work with this basically is that they do lots of lots of runs of over all those input parameters and they do a probabilistic average basically of what it would look like based on those um, uncertainty of the parameters. Yeah, great. Why is this the amount of years? Um, 
Do you have that order of magnitude? So the, the models that they run can do 10, 20, 50, 100. Um, it's a good question. I think once you look a bit more in the future, you start having very big divergence in terms of how the model predict things. And so you have quite a lot of variance. Um, and so maybe it's more interesting to look at those probabilistic estimate a long time in the future because in the short term, everybody will kind of agree. Um, but honestly, it could be 10 years. I think, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so the way that data measurements are gonna be used, so there's two things. There's a physical model that is parameterized by unknown parameters. Um, and then what they're gonna do is that they're gonna have data like precipitation, velocity at the surface and things like that. That's gonna have some uncertainty. And they're going to use those um, data to fine tune the parameters of the physical model. And then they're going to use the physical model to run things forward in time 100 years. Um, and so a lot of the work is actually around like, OK, we have measurements, but we have also uncertainty over those measurements. How do I propagate this uncertainty that I have over those measurements into my final output? Um, so I guess. <laughs> so I think what's kind of cool with this project in general is that it's going to have a thousand different issues in lots of different places. There's lots of uncertainty everywhere. and we're slowly trying to develop machine learning bits or parts of the pipeline that could be useful, basically. Um, okay, so specifically, the problem that in practice they're gonna have is that it's gonna be very expensive to run those models. Um, so a high resolution model with like a reasonable grid of like a big kilometer or two is gonna take several weeks. Um, they need to run lots of those parameters, lots of those runs over lots of initial states. Um, mainly because of this inverse problem of having to infer the bedrock, but basically the bottom line is like, they have to run this over lots of different um, input parameters. Um, and one property that's interesting is that to solve this differential equation, you're gonna use numerical solvers that are gonna spatially or temporally discretize um, your input space. Um, and so what's interesting is that the computational cost of running a model is gonna be completely correlated with the resolution and the accuracy of the model. Um, so basically the question we're asking is how small does my grid need to be to be able to accurately estimate the contribution to sea level? And intuitively, the way I think about it is like, maybe in some part of the input parameter space, I actually can get away with 10 kilometer resolution because something silly happens. And maybe in some other parts of my grid, I actually need very fine resolution because we have a fracture, for example. Um, and so in this case, I need to be very precise about what I do to order to estimate the contribution to sea level. And so the project we're working on basically is how do you optimize this accuracy cost trade-off in kind of like an automated way of running the simulator? How do you identify when you need high resolution versus low resolution? Um, and kind of like how you do all this basically. Um, to, yeah, to give a bit of an example, another intuitive example, that, okay, this is ice sheet data. Um, so we have on the X and Y axis, it's two parameters of interest. So the average melt is how fast the ice melts when it's in contact with the sea. Melt exponent doesn't matter. Um, SLC is the sea level contribution. So that's kind of the Y I put we're interested in. Um, and then partial melt is going to be talking about whether if you have a cell that's halfway uh, touching the ocean, where there's going to be um, melting or not. So it's kind of like an important parameter that the community doesn't really agree on whether it should be on or off. And what's interesting is you can see, for example, if this is on, so you have the blue that's resolution 10 and the red that's resolution five. The two resolutions agree quite a lot, but if this parameter is off, then the two resolutions really disagree. So that's kind of an example of like, okay, in this case, we can get away with high res low resolution. In this case, we need to be precise. Um, yeah, and this matters a lot. Um, so basically, this is the Antarctic. On the right side, it's telling you um, over 100 years how the ice uh, thickness is going to change through time. So, you know, you have a magnitude of a change of like 1,000 to minus 1,000 meters. Um, and on this slide, it's telling you um, between a 10 kilometer and a three kilometer simulation, what's the difference in thickness? And you're almost at the same magnitude of like a thousand meters, which means like resolution matters a lot because you get widely different simulation based on the uh, resolution that you use basically. Okay, now we're moving more towards the ML part. Um, so first I'll talk a bit about multi-fidelity experimental design, which is Combining two things you've seen in your lectures. Um, as I mentioned, I'll talk a bit about some theory inside. Um, then we'll go through a Jupyter notebook on how you can apply this 
not to the ice data because it's very slow and long to run weeks, but to like simple differential equations because this kind of ideas work on all differential systems. Um, and then some, maybe some interesting projects. Okay, uh, let's start with a toy experiment to try to get an idea of how would you make such a trade-off. Um, let's say you're trying to predict the sea level contribution when varying the melting rate between zero and 100. Um, and you can choose two things, either resolution five kilometer or 10 kilometer. You can get one sample at five kilometer, which let's say theta equals of 50, or two samples at 10 kilometer resolution, but then you can play at say 30 and 70. Um, and the question is like, which one would you choose? Um, and obviously the answer, it depends on the accuracy of the low resolution. Right? And so what it really means is that it means you need a model of the correlation between resolutions to be able to answer those kind of questions of like, what is the right resolution, right? You need to be able to quantify how accurate um, is the low resolution versus the high resolution. Does it make sense so far? Everybody good? Yeah, great. Um, okay, to formalize it a bit, um, we have a function f we're trying to learn that takes as inputs theta, which is going to be some input parameters we want to vary, like melt rate. Um, we have some resolution tau, uh, which is the grid size in kilometer for that issue model. Um, for mathematical convenience, we just say theta equals to zero is like the best fidelity in the highest resolution. Uh, and we have some output y, which is going to be the contribution to sea level that uh, we're going to work with. Um, and so the goal that, of the exercise is going to be trying to choose points that are i tau out to fit a probabilistic model f of x to this function f. Um, and we're going to combine two techniques. The first one is experimental design, which is basically saying, how do I choose my point to minimize some uncertainty over my model? Or basically, how do I choose my point to learn as much as I can about this function? And the other one is multifidality, which is basically discussing how do I leverage lower cross approximation or lower resolution to try to infer my function in a cost-efficient way. Okay, there's one more caveat that I need to add is that because uh, we're trying to optimize for this cost utility ratio, we're actually gonna be looking um, at a constrained optimization problem where we want the cost function of a point uh, the sum of the cost function of all the points to be smaller than a specific budget that we have. So, you know, if we have two weeks, then whatever points we need to choose needs to satisfy this cost constraints. Um, and so formally, basically, we find a set of points X that are going to maximize some utility set function. Uh, the reason I'm using set function is because the idea is you take a set of points um, and it returns you a scale telling you how good was it to choose those points in hindsight, basically. Yeah. Just making sure that I understand it more quick. So, and then the, by choosing the actor, it's an offline learning version, not an online version. Where, like, I choose all of them, I know in advance of their advance, and then I can go off and run the simulation. It's going to be online. Um, as in, like, we're going to select points. Uh, we're going to get some points. We're going to fit the model, try to optimize it, select the next point. And so, it's going to be um, um, online. Um, I wrote it as an offline thing, but is an iterative process, basically. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Okay, um, a very quick refresher on experimental design. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, the goal is gonna be trying to find some input points to learn as much as you can about a specific function. Um, and I think the most used framework is kind of like what's called space filling designs. Um, and so the idea is basically you, the first one is you do random sampling. The second level is you kind of create a grid um, and you're gonna to try to find points that maximize the distance metrics between those points. It's gonna call Latin hypercube sampling. It's one of the most popular one. Um, but the issue is that you can have with space filling design that you uh, might encounter is if your function has like very high frequency element that happens in parts of the space, um, then you might want like a lot of like points in this like specific region. Um, and so it's quite interesting to be able to build a model of the function to be able to say, oh, interesting things are happening in parts of the space. I want lots of points. And you won't really be able to do that with the space filling design. Um, the other thing also, if you don't build a model of the function is it's hard to input user requirements. So let's say I only care about contribution to sea level above 300. Um, with the space filling design, you're just, just gonna choose points, but you don't know what the output values are. And so that's not really gonna be helpful to like decide interesting points. Anyway, 
Um, what you've been familiar with is model-based mm -hmm. experimental design, uh, which is basically a different way of looking at it, which is, okay, I fit a probabilistic model on my uh, data points that I've collected, uh, and I'm gonna try to find points that minimize this uncertainty over this probabilistic model. Um, and so if you're gonna be doing what's called integrated variance reduction. So you find the points that would minimize uncertainty around the model, and you look at how much variance does it produce. And I think you saw that in like lecture four or something. Okay, second refresher, one slide very quickly, is the discrete multifidelity. Um, so the idea there is how do I leverage lower cost approximations? Um, so let's say I have access to a high resolution fidelity F1 and a low resolution F2. Um, I'm gonna predict uh, the output kind of like as a linear combination of like F1, it's gonna be equal to row F2 plus some error that I'm gonna be modeling as a GPS. Um, I'm mentioning this because this is gonna lead on to um, what we're doing, which is a bit different, um, which is kind of viewing it as a continuous version of us. So basically what we're gonna say is we're gonna say the discretization step is gonna be a fidelity. So you know, if I have a very large discretization step, then that's gonna be a very noisy estimate of my function. And if I have a very low discretization step, then that's gonna be very high fidelity of my set. And so in a way you can view that kind of like as a continuum of fidelity because now we're parameterized by tau, which is gonna be in like a plus. So it's like in the real, does that make sense? Okay. Um, and the interesting bit is that basically, yeah, the accuracy is fully correlated with the computational cost um, in this case. Yeah, I'll put a little picture to make it more clear. Okay, so practically what this means is I have this graph here. So I have the resolution axis here. You know, I should model which range from five kilometers to 10 kilometer. Um, five kilometer would take about a um, week to run, I think. Um, we have some input parameters of interest, like the melt average. And we once again have a sea level contribution on this set. Um, so we're interested in learning how the function behaves at the five kilometer resolution. Um, and we have two points in the higher range of the melt average there, but we have no point in the lower melt average area. Um, and so the question is, uh, can we use points at the 10 kilometer resolution to infer what the value would be at the five kilometer resolution? And so you can fit a Gaussian process model to this data. So the blue surface is gonna be the mean of the GP and the orange yellow is gonna be the uncertainty of the GP. And so the whole point of the exercise is gonna to be to learn the parameters of a kernel to kind of describe the strength of the correlation between resolution. So basically the idea is like, okay, my data is very correlated between low and high resolution, which means I'm gonna get high length scale, for example. Um, and so the 10K points is gonna leave very low uncertainty at the 5K resolution. And so in this case, basically fitting your model is gonna be equivalent to learning the correlation between the different resolution is gonna help you to make decision about what's the right trade-off. Cool, everybody happy? Okay. <laughs> um, and as I mentioned before with experimental design here, we're also gonna consider reducing the uncertainty of our model um, over the highest fidelity slice. Okay, so we talked a bit about the modeling part, which is how do I model the function uh, as well as the relationship between the different resolution. And now I'm gonna talk a bit about how you make decisions. So once I have this model that I showed in the previous slide, um, how do I optimize it? What is the utility? How do I choose the next points that I wanna sample in an interactive way? Um, and it's all connected to a lot of decision-making fields. So like you might've heard of Bayesian optimization, reinforcement learning, online learning, bandits. They'll have connections, they'll use similar ideas. And so maybe there's gonna be some terminology that belongs to different fields. Um, yeah. All right. Um, so the utility, there's two utility we can set. So as I mentioned before, if I give you a set of point X, I fit my model and I look at the residual variance, um, that's gonna be the conditional integrated variance. And the reason why I did the conditional here is because we're only conditioning at the highest fidelity because we don't care about the uncertainty at the lower fidelities. We just wanna know what's the best I can do at the highest fidelity. Um, and then because it's gonna be practical to talk about the value of adding a point, um, we're gonna talk about what is the variance reduction when I add a point. You know, I choose a point, how does it impact my GP? And it's just basically gonna be the variance with this point minus the variance minus this point. So it's just kind of like the differential when I added this point, what was the value of choosing this point? Yeah. 
Who's going to pay us for the like the slips? The yeah. Um, so that's the value. Back one is with the point, the left one. Is so this variance is going to be this integrated variance is going to be smaller, right? Because you added a yeah. point, and so yeah. should be good. Um, yeah. Another visualization. <laughs> More. <laughs> um, it's basically plotting the what a, the picture that I showed earlier, which is. If I take any point on this 2D plane of input parameters, how much is it going to reduce the variance of my GB? Um, and so obviously, the highest rate variance reduction that I can get is if I query at the fidelity 5, because I'm only interested at the resolution of 5 anyway. So anything below is obviously not interesting. Um, but the next part of the talk um, is going to focus on say, OK, yes, but we want to be somewhat cost adjusted, right? Like otherwise, just run everything at 5 kilometer and you're done. Um, you want somehow to take into account how costly it is to run each of those points. Um, and so that's basically going to be the constraint optimization problem where you're going to have a fixed computational budget and you're going to try to optimize this utility with respect to the cost. Right. Um, so what is the first thing you would do? The first thing you would do is you would take the utility of each of the point and you would divide it by its cost. Simple, right? Or some kind of normalized version of the cost. Um, and what it would give you is it would give you some kind of like scaled surface where depending on how expensive each, each of the simulation is going to tilt your surface towards an optima. You know, if you, if you have a very big differential between the low resolution and the high resolution, that is going to tilt it in one way or the other. Um, and so what's nice basically is that you kind of get this nice trade-off between um, one, the difference of cost between the resolution and two, how accurate are their lower resolution with respect to the problem that you're trying to solve? Um, and the reason why I'm saying that, so this is called greedy approximation. Um, and the reason I'm saying it's a biased solution is because in theory, okay, I have a set. I'm trying to find the best set of points to maximize some function. In theory, it's gonna be a combinatorial optimization problem, which is I would need to try every combination of points to try to find the maxima, the specific function. And here we're kind of taking a hack and we're saying, okay, I'm actually going to select points one by one. I'm going to select a point based on how useful I think it is right now. And I'm going to combine all those points together and I'm going to hope that the set together is somewhat okay. Um, so that's why it's called greedy approximation, but in theory, it would be a planning problem. Um, yeah, so as I mentioned, there's two problems. There's a communal problem, which I just chatted about. Um, the other thing that makes everything a bit harder is also we don't know what is the right utility of a point. So what I mean by that is we define the utility of a point by how much you reduce the variance on our model, right? But we are fitting our model on the data and that might change through time, right? So the intuitive way of thinking about it is like maybe at the beginning, I think low resolutions are great, um, but actually they're not. And so at the beginning, I'm going to spend a lot of time doing low resolution and realize at the end they're not. And so we're actually only maximizing a noisy version of the greedy approximation, not really the greedy approximation. Um, and this problem is going to show up basically um, in bounds that we'll look at later. Um, yeah, and it, it's quite an important part of the algorithm also. It's basically how fast can you learn how the re resolutions are correlated. And I missed it. Okay, um, I'm going back a bit on ice sheet data. Um, so on the top left, there's this graph we saw earlier with the re resolution that agrees basically quite a lot. Um, the middle graph, what it's showing is the unweighted utility. And sorry, I switched axes, but basically you have the resolution here. And obviously because it's an unweighted resolution, uh, unweighted graph, the best you can do is playing at the five resolution and there's a whole lot of uncertainty to be reduced all that. This graph in comparison is the weighted um, utility. And so you can see because the two resolution agrees that this is gonna tilt the surface towards playing lower resolution because in this case, it's interesting to do so because the resolutions agree. Um, whereas in this context of partial models where we saw that the resolution disagreed, you can view it in the utility right away that basically playing anything else in five is useless. And so no matter how much you reweight it, that's still gonna be useless. Um, and this is kind of like the kind of behavior we wanna like automate. Basically, when I sheet model is that, you know, I want to learn everything that's happening over this range of parameter, then you want to do this automatically under the hood to be able to get your estimate as quickly as possible, basically. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
in this particular case, it's also not as good as the site of the boundary. And then, for example, yeah. from here. Um, it's, yeah. So if you take a differential system um, and you take your range of the time step that you're looking at uh, to be, let's say, very high, like in the very high parts of the thing, then it's going to be at the boundary. If you make it very large, then it's going to be somewhere in the middle. And so it all kind of depends on where you put the boundaries of your problem. In the context of an ice sheet, they are supposing that even, so right now the best model we do is two kilometer um, because after we start having RAM problem. Um, and they still think it hasn't converged yet, which means that like we're thinking that at least, let's say in the partial net equals zero, even the highest resolution at two kilometer hasn't converged. And so doing all of this is not useful because you want to, you need to extend the range to what's possible. Um, so part of the work is also on like just making the algorithm more efficient such that you can run those resolutions. Um, yeah. Any other question? Great. Okay, so to recap, we have a function f that takes as input the parameter theta and tau. Uh, we try to find points theta and tau to reduce the uncertainty of our probabilistic estimate of f. And we choose points that maximize this weighted condition integrated variance. Um, and now I'm going to like talk a tiny bit about um, the regret of using this greedy strategy and when it can go wrong, basically. Um, so the nice thing about this example is that you can forget everything I said or if you've lost, you can still catch up here. And I'm going to talk about a very basic uh, computer science problem, which is called the knapsack problem. So the knapsack problem is I have a bag with a specific weight limit. Um, and I have bricks that have a value and a weight. And I'm going to try to maximize the value of my bricks while satisfying a weight constraint. Um, you can probably see how similar it is to our problem. Um, and what's interesting with this problem is that you can show that if you do this greedy strategy of um, taking the way the value of the brick and divide it by its cost, you order all the bricks and you choose the bricks greedily, then you can guarantee that you're going to be somewhat not too far from the optimal strategy. So this coefficient is like 0.63 or something. Um, and so it's kind of telling you that like, even though it's a combinatorial optimization problem that's NP-hard or whatever, you can still get reasonably good approximation um, based on this greedy strategy, basically. Um, we have a slightly different problem here because when you select a point, the value of a point is dependent on the set. It depends also on the set of what we picked before, right? If I have taken a thousand points and I take an extra point, the value of this point might be very, very small. Whereas if this is the first point that I take, um, its value will be very big. So it's not exactly the same problem because in the previous case, we had each bricks had a value and the value isn't changing. Or in the night case, we're working with set function. We only assign value to set, basically, not a point. Um, and so it's a slightly different problem, but the basically generalization of the NAFAC problem um, for those kind of like set function. And if it's only if it satisfies this concept of submodularity or diminishing returns. Um, and the intuitive way of thinking about it is if your set function works as follows. Um, wait, I like this quote, is you have more to gain from something new if you have less to begin with. Um, and in our context is let's say I have a set X and I add a new point, I get some variance reduction from this point. But now I take a much bigger set that includes the previous one. Um, and I had the same point, then the variance reduction for this new, for this one that I just added is gonna be much smaller than the one in the smallest. So that's kind of like, it kind of like talks about the structure of the set function and gives it like properties that enables you to do this greedy approximation in a somewhat useful way. Um, right. And so using basically those uh, submodular function, you can do a bit of theory and show things that, for example, if X is your greedy set that you're paying, um, and X star is going to be the optimal. Um, you can show two things. You can show that you're going to have the same greedy approximation error that for the knapsack, the one minus uh, e to the minus one f of x star, uh, which is saying the greedy approximation isn't too bad for this uh, set function. And the other one that you're going to, the other coefficient that's different and that exists in our case is because we actually can't do the greedy approximation because we don't know where the right length scale. We don't know how to choose a point because we don't know um, how to value different resolutions yet. We're still learning that. Um, and so we can't perfectly act according to greedy. And basically this is gonna be transcribed in this bound. Basically, the less we know about how the resolution behaved, the more it's gonna impact that bound. 
Okay. Okay, now we're gonna to go to much more applied stuff. We're gonna to go to the notebook. Um, okay, so I wrote a little notebook um, that's gonna basically gonna be applying this idea to uh, partial differential equations. Um, it's also on GitHub, so you can access it and play around with it if you're interested in doing a project around those ideas. Um, okay, so what we're gonna be looking at I'll make a small, I'll show you a little example. So we have, they have this partial differential equation that shows a chemical reaction that's happening and evolving through time. So you have two fields that are gonna be somewhat connected. The value of the one can be dependent from the other and you, they're gonna be evolving through time. Um, and so it's not exactly the same PD that they're used in the IFIT model, but it's an interesting one that has connection into the fusion. So somewhat similar. Um, and so what we're gonna be looking at basically is we're gonna take this um, diffusion here and we're gonna say how many cells are going to be above a certain threshold. Um, and then when we vary the resolution that we use to solve those PDE, does it change how many cells are going to be above a specific threshold? Which is a bit analogous to what we do in the IFIT model, where we kind of look, you know, what are the extreme patterns that are happening and how dependent is it on the resolution that we use to do this? Um, so yeah, basically we define the PDE that we're using. There's a diffusion or brucellator, it's called. It's an interesting name. Um, the range that's how long we run it for. Diffusion is basically the coefficient that we're going to be looking at. So in diffusion, you have the diffusion coefficient that tells you how fast, let's say, heat kind of like spread through liquid. And we're going to vary the diffusion coefficient and see how the PE behaves based on how we vary this coefficient. Um, sorry? Yeah. In uh, which, let's see. Perfect. Yeah. So, um, yeah, that's basically it for this cell. Uh, so basically how we're going to start is we're going to create some initial data. So we take um, the discretization, we're going to take two discretization step between at one minus three and one minus one. Yeah. We're going to take two diffusion coefficient between zero one and zero nine. We're going to run that through our PD client, which is going to, it's just going to output the value that I talked about earlier. So counting, the number of cells that are above a certain value on one of the field. Um, and basically, we're going to start doing, um, we're going to start plotting what the utilities looks like. So I create four points uh, that kind of define like a square that I'm going to be interested in. Um, so the step size here is going to be analogous to the resolution. So high step size here is kind of like a low cost version because you move very quickly through time. Um, and so it's going to be the same story as before. So this is an unweighted utility. And so obviously querying at the higher resolution, it's not zero, it's 0 0.01 here or 0 0.01. Um, so querying at the higher resolution basically is going to be more advantageous than querying the low resolution, uh, but that's unweighted. And then what we do basically is we're going to create a weighted version of that. Um, and the weight version of that it works as follows. So basically we take the times that it takes to run each of the numerical solvers on our equation. Um, we build a cost model. So the reason why we need a cost model is like, let's say we want to do this surface. How much does it cost to take the point in the middle? Well, I don't know that, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to interpolate how much it costs based on the points that I already have um, before. So, you know, um, let's say you take a linear average between the five and the 0 0.01 resolution and the 0 0.1. And so that's going to give you a cost of each of the different resolutions. Um, it's kind of like a factor of one to a hundred. So like the bottom resolution is a um, hundred times cheaper than the top resolution. Um, and so that gives you this weighted variant, this weighted utility now. Um, and then we can use basically MUKit, which apparently, which you should have been, I think, using a lot for this class to define this experimental design loop where we're going to have the GP model in both dimension. We're going to have the space. I defined it earlier, but it doesn't matter. We're going to be trying to, the acquisition function is going to be this weighted variance instead of just a variance. Uh, and I'm going to show a bit how it evolves, how the algorithm does basically. Um, so here it's like selected this point, then it's like this one. And so you can see that like at the beginning, it focused on the low resolution because those are the most cost adjusted useful one. Um, and then it's going to start doing something interesting. It's going to move to like, once it's done a bit of like sampling in this region, it's going to start moving on to higher resolution, basically. Um, and it's kind of going to do this like line by line. It's going to start here, then it's going to like query all of this, then it's going to query all of this. Um, 
And I think what's really interesting about this example is that it shows you the limitation um, of the greedy strategy. So what I mean by this is when you do one step optimization, obviously starting at the lowest resolution is what makes sense. It's great. But the problem here is once I sample almost the same point, but at a higher resolution, then actually I don't care about the earlier point that I use, that I sampled, right? They're kind of useless now. So if I know my budget beforehand, then why would I ever query those bad points at the beginning, those like low cost resolution points at the beginning? Um, and so what it demonstrated, it demonstrates the problem with greedy. It shows how you actually would want to be planning in the future and say, oh, let's say I have a really small budget. Okay, then I just do the low resolution and I'm done. But if I have a big budget, then I don't want to do those low resolution one because they're going to be useless in the future anyway. So I want to start much higher. Um, so this is kind of an interesting thing to consider. And people could think about lots of different ways of modifying the algorithm to incorporate this planning aspect. I don't know, that could be a project if some people are interested. Um, but yeah, it's kind of like a big issue with the model. Yeah. Um, so this isn't ice sheet. This is like the simple like these thing. So it runs in your notebook. Um, I, I don't think you can do any experiment with the ice sheet because um, it's just, yeah, very long. Um, we haven't done a full interactive run because of how much time it takes yet. So for now we've kind of been, we ran a big grid and we're kind of working on developing the algorithm that would work well on this grid. Um, but it would probably take, yeah, if one runs take two weeks, then you have this interesting question of like, do I just batch it to all the runs that I want, wait two weeks and I'm done, but that costs a lot of like parallel compute? Or do I want to be more cost efficient and then I have to do things sequentially, but that takes a lot of time forward. So, you know, what's the right trade-off depends on how cost efficient do you want to be? How much time do you have to do your thing? Um, and so that's kind of like another question we're kind of chatting with them on like, what's the right trade-off for them? Um, but yeah, if you do things sequentially and you want 10 points, then that's 20 weeks, right? <laughs> so I guess it's a balance. Um, yeah. Does this answer the question? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, so that's kind of an interesting flaw of the model basically that, it's also a problem actually in Bayesian optimization. In Bayesian optimization, they also have this, if you only plan for the next step, then you're gonna have some error in some areas like that. But I think this is a particularly nice example because it's particularly visual why it's really bad to do that. Uh, but for now, it's what people do. So interesting to improve on it. Um, yeah, so you can play around with this notebook. You can create other scenarios. You can use any differential equation that you want. This analysis, you can still do it of this cost utility. Um, you can play around with different diffusion that you can play with. Um, I implemented another diffusion equation that's very smooth. So when things are very smooth, um, obviously the resolution doesn't matter too much. Oh yeah, one point that was interesting is the specific chemical reaction that you use um, has this property that's called stiffness. Um, so I chose it because it has a stiffness and stiffness is basically saying that you need quite a fine grain uh, resolution in order to solve the problem well. Um, and if you don't have this fine grain resolution, then things are going to go crazy. Um, and so I used it because it's a good example of showing how you need to be somewhat adaptive, uh, especially if you have stiff equations. Yeah, so that's it for the notebook. Uh, and so I'm slowly going to start concluding on some interesting directions. Um, so I think it's kind of interesting because those kind of like cost analysis can be applied, as I mentioned, to any differential equations. Um, you could take dynamical systems, RL control, all of these, and kind of start doing those kind of like cost analysis. So something that's related to my PhD earlier was, um, I was looking at control problem, where let's say you're trying to control a robot. When you calculate the next action, it's gonna be an inference time. And this inference time is gonna have a, uh, an impact in the real world, right? You're just gonna be like, if you spend 10 minutes computing the next action, then your robot is just not going to work. Um, at the same time, if you have 10 minutes to compute the next action, you're going to be very accurate about this action. And so there's also this trade off that happens between, you know, how accurate do I want to be on my action versus how much time do I want to spend not doing anything? So you can, you have similar trade off that happens there. Um, in machine learning, so many decisions are about this compute accuracy trade off, right? The floating points, for example, in deep learning has this trade off. Steps in a diffusion model is going to be the same trade-off. Um, lots of interesting places where you can kind of like 
make all of this decision in a more data-driven way or try to at least analyze how this decision can be made in a more data-driven way. Um, then on the more decision marking process, you can also do a bunch of things. Uh, this myopic behavior, for example, that we saw with the greedy strategy is quite bad. Um, the other thing that we're interested in doing, which correlates to where we talked about, about picking 20 weeks for the simulator, is what I call leveraging partial information. Okay, so I start a point. I know it's going to take two weeks. I don't really want to wait two weeks to run my next point. So how can I use the information that are happening during those runs to better inform which points I should be selecting next? And so what we're going to be doing basically is saying, okay, I have two runs with different resolution. I'm going to look at checkpoints, whether they agree or not. If they agree that I'm going to use this information to infer what's the best next point to use, um, and if they disagree widely, then maybe I won't, you know, I'll like adjust according basically. But it's all it has its own specific problem because you kind of need to be projecting. Okay, if they agree at time step t, are they going to agree at time step 100? That's a modeling problem again. Um, then there's lots of interesting things you can do with like problem specific modeling choices. So maybe you have parts of your function that have non stationary and things like that. Um, yeah, I'm currently working on parts of some of those questions because it's within my area of research. So feel free to email me if you have any questions about that. And yeah, so lots of people involved in this. So we got uh, four people from the British Antarctic Survey that have been helping us a lot defining, running the model, defining the model, what are ice sheets, how they work. And then at the bottom, we have the more machine learning crew uh, have been working on this with. And thank you. Thank you for that. It was really interesting. Like something which I'm not sure if you do, but seems to be quite relevant here. When you're doing that optimization and saying, okay, how exactly do we model our relationship to fidelity and so on? Then I assume there is a fair bit of uh, knowledge that we can impose there. Like, for example, generically, naively, if I now have like a quite a big resolution on a few days, I should take like about four times as much time, you know. Like, how, like, what can we really impose that uh, knowledge when doing all these things? So, prior knowledge with respect to how the resolution relate or with respect to the cost? Anyone. Yeah. So with respect to how the prior knowledge relates, well, then that's when you can start working. Um, it's a bit what I think Neil talked about in the previous lecture around multi fidelity, right? You can start doing assumptions, right? Oh, there's a nonlinear relationship between my fidelity. There's a linear relationship. You can start doing things like that. Um, in our case, we're kind of like making the, probably some of the mildest, I don't know if it's mildest assumption, but we're kind of saying, we don't know if there's a functional relationship between them. We're just going to say, take the distance between them. And then it's going to be kind of like a noise like the further they are from each other, the more of a noisy version of the other it is. That's kind of like the approximation, but there's lots of things you can do to be smarter about how you model those um, resolution. Um, the cost part is relatively, I assume that it's kind of like given to you almost, like you know how each points cost, because practically you can kind of do linear interpolation between those. If you have an expensive one and a cheap one, then the middle one is going to be somewhat of a linear interpolation of the two, usually, ish. So we don't spend too much time on this aspect. Um, yeah. Question? Yeah. You were speaking about what you can do if you got a certain time together and you can run the same to you. Yeah. You take it to your three You keep it free. Is there any way to find that kind of operating the pedicle time together you got? Yeah, so that's exactly what I'm thinking about in the last two, three days. Is how do you like what's the right mathematical way of characterizing this uh, constrained optimization problem such that is that a way to say, okay, five is the best resolution you can do there, and it will just won't explore those under one. Um, I think there's there's gonna be lots of approximation to this problem uh, that you can find. Um, so okay, in theory. The theory of how you would do that is a combinatorial optimization problem. You would take all the combination and try which one would be the best one, but you don't want to do that. Um, and so you're going to use kind of like hacks to try to approximate and build a set that makes sense. But I don't have a clear 
idea yet. Feel free to <laughs> have an idea there. Um, yeah, the time scale. How long you can think about it? <laughs> I don't know. Brilliant. <laughs> Thank uh, yeah, for a really great talk. No one else is. 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 No one else is.